Thank you. Um, so first I'd like to thank the Gunter Werner Institute for this invitation and also for uh, treating me so nicely and making interpretation available basically just for me. So it's a, it's a very warm welcome, but a very uh, powerful reminder of how I should have taken those lessons at the Gunter Institute much more seriously. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but thank you for inviting me. Um, first, I'll be speaking about what I call anti-gender movements uh, in Europe and across the world, um, which uh, reflects very well uh, what uh, Professor Birsel just explained here in Germany. Um, but um, uh, I'd just like to preface my presentation by, 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 the, by explaining that my job is not really to study anti-gender movements. I'm the secretary of the European Parliamentary Forum for Sexual and Reproductive Rights. So we work to support members of parliament from all democratic parties to improve sexual and reproductive health and rights. And, um, and so we want to improve the situation. However, over the past 10 years or so, what we saw is the emergence of different anti-reproductive rights, anti-sexual rights initiatives in different countries around Europe. And when these emerged in different countries, our national partners started calling us and saying, you know, Neil, this thing uh, is happening. We have an anti-abortion measure, an anti-comprehensive uh, sexuality measure in Portugal or in Latvia or uh, in the Netherlands or, or somewhere else. And um, what should we do? And we started noticing that it was some of the same names of organizations and individuals that were appearing in all these different places. And so since we had this bird's eye view, we were able to start studying it a bit more and then try to explain it when it started happening. So that's a bit our entry point into this. Okay. Now, in order to understand anti-gender movements, and I'll explain why I call them anti-gender rather than anti-feminist, as, as has been, uh, as has been uh, done up until now, um, I'd like to take us to, I'd like to provide a bit of historical context, okay? Uh, now, uh, this year is, is exactly 25 years uh, since a rather historic moment. 25 years ago, the international community gathered together in Cairo and held a conference on population and development. The following year, they met in Beijing and held a conference on women. Those were known as the ICPD, International Conference on Population and Development, and then the Beijing uh, Platform for Women. These two UN-sponsored conferences were very important in that for the first time, you have the notions of sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights entering the UN system. And, the, and, uh, and what's called a, a paradigm shift takes place so that population issues are no longer understood as needing to suppress population growth and implement population control. Population issues are then understood to put women at the center of development and women's rights and women's agency and women's ability to control their own reproductive lives. So this is what happened in, 19, in the mid-1990s, in 94 and 95. In 95 is when we recognize that women's rights are human rights. Okay, so these are big historical developments relatively recently. And this is what allowed for two and a half decades of advances in human rights in matters of uh, women's rights, sexual rights, reproductive rights, etc. For example, now female genital mutilation is recognized as a violation of women's rights. Way back then, it was still seen through the prism of cultural relativism. Okay, so big advances for the human rights community. Equally, what was an advance for one set of actors was equally a defeat for another set of actors. The ones who felt defeated were, were primarily the Vatican and then other socially conservative countries and movements and actors. And so what happens when you, su when you suffer a defeat? Imagine a bit like a, as if they were a political party who have just lost an election. After such a defeat, you go into a period of introspection and you start wondering, what, what happened to us? Why did we lose? Um, was it our leaders, our narrative, our strategy? What happened? And what happened then, as they were reflecting upon this, a number of Catholic thinkers from Latin America and Europe started conceptualizing what, why it is that they lost and how to recoup and how to regain the lost territory. The reason that they, uh, that they conceptualized that they lost was because of gender ideology. They had lost to gender ideology. Now, what is gender ideology? It's nothing. It's not a real concept except a descriptive to uh, 
it's a descriptive label onto anything which displeases the Vatican. Okay, so anything, women's rights, <laughs> LGBT rights, that's all the result of gender ideology. But there are no ideologists behind, gen behind gender ideology. It's not a real thing except a label. So what did they start to do? They started taking their old religious ideas, which had failed in the 1990s, and then repackaged them into something fit for the modern world. So instead of being against something, against women's rights, against gay rights, they thought of being in favor of something else. So what they are in favor of is human dignity. Now this is a Catholic concept, but it can work very well in a secular world. We're all in favor of human dignity, I'm sure. Human dignity articulated through three lenses. One is life. We're all in favor of life, but life, the protection of life from the moment of conception until natural death. So this is why certain things which to us appear unrelated, such as abortion or contraception and the right to die in dignity and euthanasia, are related under this, uh, under this prism. Next is family. And I emphasize the singular uh, nature of this word, family, not families. Um, family in that, that meaning the heterosexual, traditional, patriarchal family. Usually the idealized family of the 1950s. And then religious freedom, we're all in favor of religious freedom, but here what they specifically mean is the right of the faithful to derogate from national laws, for example, on discrimination, on hate speech, etc. And what we have here is basically a view of the world where human sexuality is only sanctioned if it has the explicit purpose of procreation in some sort of sanctified union between a man and a woman. Any other expression of sexuality is prohibited. And then here we have the enemies who are, who are going against our beautiful vision of the world based on human dignity. So basically what we have is old religious ideas that have been put through some sort of washing machine which secularizes them, and then you come out with fresh modern vocabulary and narratives that are fit to be used and pretend that they're modern human rights language a big secularizing washing machine. Now, what are their targets? The previous speaker alluded to this a little bit. Myself and David Paternot from the Université Libre de Bruxelles um, have identified five main, areas of, uh, five main target areas for this new anti-gender movement. So we have the traditional areas of uh, contestation, sexual and reproductive health and rights, but I think it's important here to emphasize some of the areas that we thought there had been appeasement and consensus are now up for contestation again. So it's not just abortion, but divorce, contraception, and new areas such as uh, um, assisted reproduction. Naturally, LGBTQI rights. I would also emphasize children's rights is one area that we uh, specifically overlook, and specifically who gets to control what happens to a child. Just in your neighboring country in Poland right now, there's a draft law being considered in parliament called Stop Pedophilia Law, uh, the Stop Pedophilia Bill, which seeks to criminalize comprehensive sexuality education with up to three years imprisonment. So it's not theoretical, it's happening right now in your neighbor. Um, gender, that's been mentioned before. Anything, uh, this new movement is allergic to anything with the, even the word gender. The Trump administration has requested that that, that that word be eliminated from a number of key US government documents. And then laws and policies against hate speech and discrimination. Um, so now we have our new narrative. Next, we need to find the troops uh, uh, in, order to, in order to go against these advances of human rights that are displeasing to us. So, as I mentioned, the original thinking around uh, anti-gender, this human dignity, life, family, and religious freedom, was developed with, within, within Catholic circles. First, within intellectuals, and then it migrated to the Catholic hierarchy. And then, other religious communities also found this to be a very useful product to, to take up. First among these religious communities were the Protestants of North America and the evangelical communities of Latin America. They are the first ones who took this up. In Europe, the Protestants that we've noticed so far taking this up tend to be the small communities of traditionalist Protestant believers which still exist in many different countries, even though the mainstream Protestant religion may have moved on to a more progressive uh, positioning. 
And then most recently, uh, there's been approaches to the, Rus to the Orthodox world, most, uh, most significantly to the Russian Orthodox Church. And so there you have a picture of uh, Pope Francis and Patriarch Kirill of the Russian Orthodox Church. They met, uh, it's about two and a half years ago in La Habana in Cuba. Um, and so they discuss, it's the first meeting between these two church leaders in, in almost a thousand years since the Great Schism of uh, 1054. And so they discuss, and what do they, what do they agree on? they agree on that the biggest threat to human civilization is gender ideology. Uh, so, we have the new narrative, we have the alliances with other religious actors. Next, you need to build an infrastructure to move this forward, okay? Now, in Germany and in most of, the Western, most of Western Europe and in fact the Western world, when abortion became liberalized in the 1970s, that's about the same time as pro-life movements start appearing to sort of contest the liberalization of these, uh, of these progressive abortion laws. But at the same time, as you know, here in Germany and same in France or Belgium, Belgium or other countries, these pro-life movements were ba basically had very limited impact. They weren't able to change legislation. They were at most a nuisance that was easily contained. Um, and by the end of the 1990s, early 2000s, it was a largely old and moribund movement. But what we see now is that a new generation of uh, civil society organizations appears and two processes uh, take place. One is professionalization, and another one is transnational networking. So in terms of professionalization, new NGOs are being created. Um, new uh, pre-existing NGOs take on a much broader remit than previously simply being against abortion. They take on the broad remit of the anti-gender package. Um, and we see them developing a set of different professional skill sets. Whereas for the past 25 years, human rights and even NGO meant that you were somehow progressive and you, and you could be, and, and we had basically a private hunting ground in decision-making spaces for the progressives. You had to make your case, convince the decision makers, they, and then incrementally rights uh, uh, improved, improved, improved over the past 25 years. Now we have a generation of anti-rights, anti-gender organizations making their way into the same elite decision-making spaces of the United Nations, the Council of Europe, the European Union, and in the decision-making at different national level. We see social network mobilization, the use of fake news, the use of participatory democracy tools. It's not an accident that in the space of three years there were referenda on equal marriage for LGBT versus traditional marriage in about five different Central and East European countries. Uh, litigation is an important one, uh, and then also the, the use of mass protests. Marches for the March for Life here in Germany was cited. It should be pointed out that Marches for Life, uh, marches for life have appeared in approximately 10 different countries around Europe just in the past 10 years. Before that, they were a non-existing phenomenon. In Belgium, for example, they, it's a new phenomenon. So some examples of professionalization. So there you have the, the picture um, uh, on the far right, uh, far left, I'm sorry. That's Paris in 2013, the mass demonstrations of La Manif pour tous uh, against equal marriage. So just think of the effort and the discipline that it took to have that cohesive pink and blue branding among all of these different people, okay? Next, you have a picture in the European Parliament of a hearing uh, of an anti-gender measure to ban EU funding on anything related to the destruction of the human embryo. So this is just to indicate two things. One, the use of participatory democracy tools. This initiative collect, called One of Us collected 1.7 million signatures, and two, their access to elite decision-making spaces. Next here, um, the picture at the bottom is um, of an ongoing litigation case um, to uh, in Sweden. This illustrates two things. Uh, well, I, for, I'll explain a little bit. Um, this is a Swedish midwife who says she is Christian and therefore the victim of discrimination because, the law, because she cannot get a job, because the law in Sweden does not allow for conscientious objection. In Sweden, 
the law uh, uh, feels that, or the, the um, lawmakers feel that if you're going to be a midwife, you need to be able to do abortion. It's part of the job. And so she feels discriminated against uh, as a result of this. So she's taken her case to the Swedish courts. She has lost. And now she's taking it to the European Court of Human Rights with the assistance of some US-based uh, uh, um, litigation groups. And there we have Citizen Go, experts in creating petitions to spam different decision makers on different issues. Here, this is a, a European version of a similar uh, uh, of a similar slide that uh, our friend from Germany presented. So it's not important to understand the slide. Okay, Sim same with the German one. <laughs> um, just to say that these organizations at national level, just like any other social movement, are extremely interconnected with. Uh, similar movements all across Europe and across the world. They are just as able um, as, uh, as a progressive movement to buy an affordable uh, airplane ticket or a train ticket, stay in a two or three star hotel and organize meetings such as this, and they do. Okay? And, um, and also many of these people, like many, uh, many of the anti-gender actors, just like many of us, have, sev are, have several nationalities. So that uh, you have one here, um, the cousin of Beatrix von Storck, Paul von Oldenburg, and Andres Kemper knows this very well. He's often in Brussels. He's the head of a Brussels-based organization which advocates to the European Parliament. The same Paul von, Hol uh, uh, Paul von Oldenburg is also on the boards of organizations in Poland, in Slovakia, in Belgium, and in the Netherlands. So we need to understand that this is a transnational network and uh, phenomenon. What do they discuss in these different, um, in these different uh, transnational networks? I've taken an example of one called the political network of values. It's one that tries to appear the most mainstream and normal and tries to hide their religious extremism. But this is from their own slide, that, uh, from their own uh, PowerPoint for their internal meeting. You can see here some of the things that they want to talk about. Defund IPPF, that's the parent organization of Po Familia here in, German, uh, here in Germany. Surrogacy, marriage. Abortion, here they, point, they articulate their long-term strategy. Abortion, first prevent, then if you can, restrict, and finally ban. So that's what they're discussing. And you can see here, where are they active? They're active at global, regional, at the OAS, that's Organization of American States, EU, Council of Europe, African Union, and at the different national levels. And you can see here, this is in their own words, fostering a political agenda worldwide on life, family, and freedom. A very positive message. And you can see here, they held this meeting in the European Parliament in 2017. I'll talk a little bit about the politics and the geopolitics of, uh, of the anti-gender movement. So as was alluded to earlier in terms of different actors which don't have a relationship uh, coming together, what we see is three different movements and sets of actors which had pre-existed but are now converging together. So we have religious actors now interacting with far-right actors and now interacting with populist actors. A very good way of understanding how this dynamic works is to look at the United States. So for the populist actor, imagine the face of Donald Trump, the president. For the religious actor, imagine the face of, um, of uh, Vice President Mike Pence. And then the third uh, for, the, uh, for the far right, imagine Steve Bannon. You can see how the three of them, even though it looks like an unlikely marriage, do work well together and each one benefited from this. And imagine the same thing happening in all the different countries uh, in Europe, but with a German angle, a French one, a Belgian one, and all of that. But it's basically the same thing. In terms of political space, okay, in terms of political space, I'll hurry up now, what had previously been a very clear divide between establishment right-wing parties, center-right, the CDU, CSU, and then the traditional far-right uh, here in Germany, NPD or Front National in France. Now the lines are blurring between, uh, between uh, what had previously been this border, and we're discovering that a new political space, and with this political space, a new electorate is, emer is, is there. And this political space combines ethno-nationalism, so anti-immigrant, plus social conservatism, anti-gender, so there you have different notions where they can come together in favor of a Christian Europe. So three trends happening with this uh, new space. We have mainstream center-right parties 
flirting and experimenting with the idea of greater social conservatism. Examples come from France and uh, Spain. This has not so far been a successful experiment. Secondly, older far-right uh, political parties are now becoming more socially conservative so that far-right parties such as the Front National, La Lega, which had not been religious in, uh, in inspiration, now are discovering religion. You see here Matteo Salvini kissing a crucifix. I leave it to you to judge how, uh, how sincere that is. And then we have new political parties emerging, AFD, Vox in uh, Spain. We have a geopolitical angle um, where uh, um, the European Union had, has been a bastion of, uh, pro of progressive uh, values, progressive pro-gender, pro-SRHR values. The United States depends very much on who is in the White House. We have the Vatican, who has been defending the social doctrine of the church. And then we have Russia emerging as a new actor, which has constructed its own identity as a socially conservative orthodox nation, and also a valid alternative to what they call the degenerate Euro-Sodom gay Europa. This can be attractive to certain leaders or societies. We have examples of how this plays out in soft, uh, soft, uh, soft diplomacy, uh, anti-gender soft diplomacy. So we have uh, Viktor Orban organizing in September of this year an international summit on, demog on demography. We have the Americans uh, holding what they call an interministerial on religious freedom. Uh, we have the Russians organizing a Eurasian women's conference. I was myself at that conference. It's a vision of women of the 1950s. Um, I'm near the end. We have unexpected, unexpected battlegrounds. Um, whereas on the one hand, we're not too sure where, their fund, where the funding for the anti-gender movement is coming from. It's not transparent. It tends to be dark money or private funding. One thing is for sure. They have strategized and conceptualized where does the funding for the progressive actors come from, and they are targeting that. So there are campaigns in the US, and they're trying to export these to Europe to defund these progressive actors. Then there's also uh, a strategy of poisoning the well, where they are demonizing uh, George Soros and the open society, so that some actors in some countries have had to proactively go out into the public and say, I will not accept uh, Soros money. And one that surprised me is undermining laws uh, on gender-based violence and violence against women. So here you have a bus in circulating in Spain, uh, uh, equating violence against women laws with feminazis, and a very tasteful picture of Adolf Hitler wearing lipstick. Um, and you've seen attempts to mobilize against, uh, against violence against women laws, and which has resulted in failures to uh, ratify the Istanbul Convention in a number of different countries. So end objective, uh, a number of people think that maybe the end objective is, that's often envisioned is that of The Handmaid's Tale of Margaret Atwood. That may be true. I would say that there may be different competing end objectives at play here. Different visions of what the state should be are a central underlying role in, uh, in many of these anti-gender mobilizations. For some, it is a very small state that is desired. You see this more in Anglo-Saxon and in the, American, in, in the Americas, so that Bolsonaro, uh, when, when he came to power, slashed the uh, uh, regulations, etc. Same with Trump. In other settings, it is that of a strong state. We see this more in our in our continent here, with Poland, Russia, uh, uh, um, uh, Hungary. You see a social organization based on religion and a mutually re uh, legitimizing relationship between religious actors and political elites. So that if they were to have their, their, their way, the, the societies would tend to look like a little bit the, the, um, the, authoritarian, the authoritarian regimes of Latin America and Iberia of the 1960s and 70s. So just some key lessons, and, I'll, and that, this is my last slide. Thank you, Henning. Um, one is that no country is spared. Um, this can happen in any, in any country. And I'll just point out that um, I, I, I mentioned the case of litigation of this midwife in, in, in Sweden. There have been at least 15 attempts in the past four years to change the Swedish law on abortion. So if it happens there, it can happen anywhere. Um, this phenomenon is equally national and transnational. You cannot look at it just from one lens, otherwise you only get uh, half the picture. And people who may be marginal in your country may be big players in another country. 
No issue is spared. It's some people think that if we avoid the controversial issues, if we avoid abortion or LGBT, if we just focus on family planning or, or you know, the nice safe issues, that will be okay. That's wrong. Uh, everything is on the agenda. And it's, an, it's a question of when do they think, according to their analysis of the different opportunity structures in a specific context, what will happen uh, on, a, on a given issue. Also, anti-gender is malleable. Um, it's the solution to everything, okay? So if you, uh, and, you can, and, you can, and you can take the anti-gender package and offer it for any different circumstance. An example is um, Romania and Bulgaria. Uh, it was in 2018, Romania was having a referendum on traditional marriage, putting that in the constitution. Bulgaria was ratifying, was meant to ratify the Istanbul Convention. So you have LGBT, violence against women, two unrelated areas. But the same campaign was running in both countries. You could even, ch you could even uh, use the same visuals in Romania and in Bulgaria. And, um, and both of them were, uh, I mean, so it was a solution to both, uh, to both issues. So I'll leave it here. I know I'm, on, uh, I'm run out of time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Herzlichen Dank für den Überblick. Es gibt jetzt auch noch ein paar Fragen. Uh, uh, you, you can stay here. Yes, stay here and we want some questions. So. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Annette Henninger. Um, you focused on the Catholic part of the, of the network. We could easily uh, draw some more slides for the evangelical part. <laughs> which is uh, especially in Germany very influential. Um, thanks for this uh, somewhat uh, depressing news. Um, could you say something like two or three sentences on what could we do uh, ab against this? <laughs> mm. Gegenstrategien haben wir ja morgen noch. Ich lasse noch die zweite Frage eben zu. First. I would like to ask you and Ursula Birsel if we could have your presentations by PDF, that would be very helpful. And a second is more like a remark. I think if you say it's all faces of the gender issue, we have to realize they don't order anymore by LGBTE and heteronormative, but they also attack everything heteronormative, which is not patriarchal orthodox. So this is very important for our coalitions, I think. So, uh, in order to say something positive and also what to do, I, usually what I say is um, that first thing um, is understanding what we're up against. If we have an enemy and they consider themselves our enemy, we need to we need to size them up and see who it is that they are and how it is that they're organized. And I think, I mean, I've tried to offer my understanding of this, but there's also different ways of understanding this. But I think that's a, an initial step that we need to, that we need to do. A second thing is that um, we need to see how it is that we can, we can surf on their energy so that they are busy trying to undermine certain things. At the same time, w um, women's rights, sexual reproductive rights, for a certain number of years now, in my opinion, the biggest enemy has not been anti-gender, but it has been complacency. And I think by showing that this is a hot issue and that is easily contested and that the rights that women and, and well, all humans have now can easily be undermined is a way to get politicians, uh, different political elites uh, to take action to further guarantee them. If we take a look at abortion, for example, there's been a very uh, passive uh, approach to this where the laws were adopted in the 1970s and very little demand was done in order to modernize in order to modernize these laws take them out of the criminal code and really guarantee abortion as a woman's rights um, it's now coming up and I know you have it's coming up in Germany uh, in different ways uh, but I think being proactive in um, in making demands is another thing that we need to do <laughs> <laughs>